Welcome back, listeners, to Learning from Friends. This is Cade Curtis, your tour guide in this lovely adventure that we have. And I look forward to every single podcast episode I get to do. And today I'm speaking to my friend, Matt. And for him to be able to come in and spend some time with us is awesome. We are doing this podcast remotely because he lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm here in Georgia. It's about a seven hour drive to get back and forth. So it is a blessing that we have the opportunity to do this recording. Matt's going to be my second remote recording for it. And a fun fact as well is this is Matt. His dad, John, was on the podcast earlier talking about his experience being a professional drummer over the years. So this is my first uh, father-son kind of a experience of coming on to the podcast here. Now, before we start getting into introducing the topic and everything, we have my mom's quote uh, that she sends to us to be able to use on the podcast. And today is a little special one uh, because not too long ago, we had uh, Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters pass away and near and dear to both Matt and I's heart, along with several of these listeners here. So uh, this fit perfectly for it. Mom sent me this quote not too far after the passing. This is a Dave Grohl quote from years ago that he uh, he put out there. And for also, it fits Matt as well. So the quote, again, from Dave Grohl is, no one is you, and that is your superpower. Wow, it's just, that's a great quote. I love that. And I, I've used that quote on, I have a whiteboard in my room uh, at the entryway. And every day I write a new quote just for the kids to be able to walk in and see something different. Because uh, if we have all those inspirational quotes that you see on the wall of like, hang in there with the cat, like kind of paw uh, up there. I, those things to me are a little, just too cheesy. So I'd like to have something different every day. So for the topic of today, that Matt's going to speak on us weird. Uh, speak, speak of us with is this man is a person that I was in high school with. We rocked out for all this different time, nearly every weekend, Saturday, sometimes Sundays, um, and we lost a little bit of our hearing over the years. This kind of happens, but uh, and we discovered many types of music together over the years with an earlier guest as well, Bobby, which we played in a band together with. In the topic we're going to be discussing today, going completely sideways, is nuclear energy and other sources of energy that we use currently today. So with no further ado, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Cade. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, always a pleasure to nerd out and hang out with friends. Yeah. Good old Learning from Friends podcast here is a great experience to be able to share my friends with the world. So Matt, how do we know each other? Oh, it goes goes back quite a bit, but um, sophomore year of high school, uh, we all had some mutual friends um, in a, 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 how should I say, garage band and a uh, tight group of guys. They, I am extremely thankful uh, for having the friends that I that I did and that we did in high school and just being able to be so open with each other and um, and really feel safe and just not have to worry about most of the high school drama that unfortunately a lot of people do have to deal with. Yeah. Cause we, we went to two different high schools as well. You went to Sequoia. I went to Cherokee. So there was that separation there um, as well. And I, I don't really consider us a garage band. I consider us a basement band. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Uh, oh gosh. Good stuff. So that that's exchanged some funny stories here. That's changed some moments here. What what is one of your first memories that you remember of us kind of meeting or doing something like that? That's the first one I like to start with. Oh, I have to say, one of my first memories was uh, when when you first came over to Bobby's house, uh, and I, we were planning a jam set, and we were very first starting to uh, to figure out uh, playing together and and starting a band. And you guys were talking about back in the day um, how you used to jam in middle school, and uh, one of your I think your drummer created a speaker out of a CD. <laughs> and then uh, you guys were talking about putting wheels on a couch, I think, and then rolling it down a hill. And uh, and that fed my soul. It was all about that. Yeah, that good good times with those little builds up there because Bobby and I had known each other for years before that. So we had our own little stories. One of my earliest memories is with first meeting you is we you came in, you were sitting down at a kit, and the way you looked at it, the kit was just kind of like, 
this is a piece of art and I have to examine every little piece of it before I started playing. And that was just to me was very fascinating that you spent that time in detail onto what you were doing. And from there on out, it was like, okay, this is, this is going to work. I think we actually pulled you in. You played drums with this. We were like, nah, this is not going to work. And then we played with another drummer too. And they were like, okay, let's bring this guy back. Like this, this is the guy that, that we want to be able to play with. And the rest is kind of history here. That's, that's going to some fun stories. Cause we have a lot of interesting fun stories here. What are, what are some of yours? Oh yes, we do have a lot. Uh, well, one that sticks out is uh, one night we were, I don't remember if it was 4th of July or it was after some event, maybe it was after a show. Um, we, we decided to get a bunch of aluminum foil from I think Publix or, or Kroger or something like that. Ingles. And make Ingles. Uh, Ingles. Oh man, that brings me back. And we made armor and we made swords and we got uh, some of the zoom buggies with the motors on it at the store and we dueled each other like they were motorized horses with aluminum swords. That was a uh, moment that absolutely sticks out of my head. Good old jousting. Yeah, good, good old jousting. And I think we have a couple of those videos still floating around somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I think that was when we were in the college days, we went like at Georgia Highlands, we went to Georgia Highlands together and we literally lived with each other uh, during that time for the year and a half that I was there. Uh, just Those living were great together times. And going, Goldfish and apple juice. <laughs> yes. In Butterfly Hill in Moo Cows. That's right. What, one of my favorite memories of Matt that is kind of ridiculous, but it's kind of part of our life story is we were, uh, we would, t- Bobby had a van. And we used to take the seats out of the van to be able to store all of our stuff in going to concerts that we were in gigs that we were playing. So we had the, the bench seat in the basement. We're sitting there on the seat and it's a couple of our friends and two of them get up and Matt's sitting on the very end of it. And as they get up, the seat starts to kind of tilt backwards and fall, which only takes about two seconds for it to hit. And he reaches out to one of our friends and goes, I need you as he crashes to the ground, but it was just the whole passion and joy of like, maybe he was job falling off like a 10 story building. It's like, I need you. And then he hits the ground. That, that, that was an, an enjoyable moment for me of remembering that. <laughs> that was a passionate, passionate cry out. Roxanne. I remember that van. Right. Yeah. Red. Yeah. Good, good old, good old Roxy. Yeah. Roxy Roxanne. That, that was a fun van. Well, what's another one? We'll, we'll do two, we'll do uh, two more. We'll just kind of give two more back and forth just for fun because we have a ton of them. Oh, absolutely. Well, of course, I always cherished our bonfires out in the cow pasture. Um, yeah. I, one thing that stuck out in my head was the lookout cow. That always cracked me up. Whenever the cows would sleep, they would herd together in a big ball. And then there would always be one cow that, that was awake just kind of doing circles around the herd. Um, but specifically speaking... I have to say, uh, the the Roman Candle War was quite an epic and uh, very fun night. Of course, being high schoolers, uh, we took a lot of risks, but we definitely uh, put paintball masks on to be, at least cover that base. And that was uh, that night was extremely fun. Yeah, the, we had several of those over the years, but uh, my favorite one of doing those moments of the the. The bond, not bonfires, but yeah, the bonfires, but the Roman candles more specifically is one of them. Matt is in a boot, like on his foot, like, like he has messed his foot up and he's in a boot and he's just running around like nobody's business. And at one point there's like a, not a cliff, but there's like a little spot where it stops from grass and just becomes dirt to going down towards the lake And the dude falls and just hits, 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 hits and gets up in complete stride and just keeps running as people are like shooting him with these Roman candles. And I don't know how he didn't mess up his foot even more from that. Cause you just had no care in the world. I think it was the adrenaline kind of pop pumping yeah, and luck. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's very true. The last one I'll share is I, we love to go to thrift stores and just buy random stuff, then make weird little videos and, and stuff to kind of have one of the most hilarious of the videos was I bought this stuffed eggnog carton that was like a stuffed t- plush toy and gave it to matt for christmas and next thing i know matt has taken the video camera and is like taking it and putting it in random spots and making voices for it and just talking back and forth to this thing like it was a human being it was hilarious i loved it and it just became like an obsession for like a month or two of just 
random moments where he'd be like, pull up the, the eggnog and just start talking like it was a, an extra person in the room. <laughs> oh, the plush little eggnog. It was close to my heart. One more from you, Matt. One more from you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep going forward. Well, this one actually is more uh, a story of when we were jamming with Corey. Uh, there was one night when uh, Corey whipped out the, the, I think it was called a Wombolo. Oh, yeah. Les Claypool oh. style. Like He saw it and he made one. Yeah. Brilliant instrument. So he had cemented a two by four into a bucket and attached the head of a stand up bass to it on a hinge and used that to tension a string, a single string going down uh, this, this two by four neck and a pickup at the base that was picking up uh, the, the string that was tensioned with your left hand as you kind of just like pivoted the, the head of the with a hammer. Base. With a hammer, with the hammer. Attached, yeah, that's attached to the handle to tension it as well. I have to say that was that combined with the Moog or the Mooger Fuger was, yeah. uh, I suppose, Moog. Um, that was an epic experience. Um, well, actually, okay, so that bleeds right into the same story of um, recording the movie that Corey was working on for school. So Corey was going to school, and I think he was was he minoring in film. No, he just took a lot of those classes because he loved being able to photography and cinematography. So. Oh, yes. Those were uh, those were good times. Yeah, I think we were up in Cornelia and we're sitting in the we're on the side of like a bank or an old some old building. And we're sitting there. And at one point, Bobby has to throw a glass bottle. I think it's your head or my head like and it misses us. And it just shatters up above it. And next thing you know, cops are pulling up and going, hey, guys, they, what's kind of going on? And we have to explain the situation and kind of what's going on. And we were asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> For the sake we, part. But we cleaned up after ourselves. We cleaned up direct after ourselves. We did. We were yeah. responsible. <laughs> so, Matt, before we go into the actual topic itself, give me some background about yourself uh, before we go into the topic of how you know a bunch of this stuff? Sure. Well, um, I guess it all boils down to the fact that I am a nerd at heart. Um, I love science, physics, space, uh, pretty much anything that you start back. It's all very close to my heart. I can't really put my finger on exactly why I, uh, I love science and physics so much, but I think it has to do with my, my natural curiosity about everything. When I was a kid, I used to bug both my parents so much about just questions about everything. Why is, how is the light light? Why is it the color it is? Um, just all kinds of, of questions about everything that I saw. And I grew up with ADD. So I think I naturally just focused on visual things around me, tactile. I was very much a, a tactile kind of learner, a visual learner. I love building things. And so I think as that evolved, uh, over time, it just became a love of, of science and physics and how everything works. So curiosity is certainly something that is close to my heart. And what also, is, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, oh, no, not at all. Um, I was just going to follow up and say that I'm extremely uh, thankful to be, uh, to have been born, you know, and, and where I was and, and in the circumstances I was and uh, to have had access to education and and just to have met you and to have met the group of guys that we uh, grew up with and um, just extremely thankful to to be alive. Yeah, I'm for sure that we have our our nice group of the night crawlers, as we used to call ourselves, uh, <laughs> to be able to to thank for a lot of those good experiences. Now, don't you have a degree in aerospace engineering? Ah, funny story. So my uh, original major was aerospace engineering, and our professors were all hinting that um, aerospace is a dying industry. Uh, you guys should go to nuclear engineering because that is the future. So a um, handful of us all kind of um, packed our bags, went over to the nuclear department, and uh, set up camp. So my degree is actually in, uh, is in nuclear engineering, uh, nuclear and radiological engineering. and um, I actually work currently as a mechanical engineer at a medical device company and um, fell in love with that, of course. So, uh, but my first job, I was actually able to use some of that nuclear um, 
education. Some of the equipment we made were radiation detectors, and we used nuclear sources to assay different materials, density, moisture content. So, of course, nuclear is always close to my heart. Uh, it has a lot to do with physics and science, and it is, um, has always perked my curiosity because it's kind of the world of the unknown. It always used to drive me nuts a little bit in school because you can't see anything you're studying, and, and really, um, a lot of it is just kind of abstract initially, and, and you, it, you begin to kind of get an intuitive sense of certain aspects of nuclear technology, but others are just non-intuitive. Which part of that is uh, is alluring to the curious, curious side of me? Good old curious Matt here. Now, Indeed. there is a lot of global, global need for energy because our population is getting bigger every single day. And specifically in Africa, India, and China, that population is just booming uh, with all that new people that are being born. So we have to be able to figure out how to keep up with these energy sources. And there is some major sources that we're going to dive into today before we get to the nuclear portion. There is like chemical, which is natural gas and kind of coal. There is the nuclear, which we'll discuss later of the fission and fusion, the photovoltaic, uh, which correct me if I'm saying that wrong. Did I say it right? Oh, that's right. Yep. Okay. And then which comes into like thermal and solar energy, something that we're trying out a lot right now. And then the mechanical, which is like wind and hydroelectric. Can we go into a little bit of explanation of each individual one of these just so the listener can be able to understand a little bit more? Sure, absolutely. So I guess um, to, to kind of zoom out to the big picture, each of these energy sources is tapping into um, a fundamental force that uh, of which there are four, at least commonly known. Uh, there's the nuclear forces, which hold subatomic particles together. There are the electromagnetic forces, which hold electrons and protons uh, in orbit. They dictate chemical bonds. Um, and there's uh, mechanical energy, which is also just a, a form of electromagnetic energy. And, and then gravity and the uh, weak nuclear force, we probably won't cover. Um, but uh, specifically, if we go into the different energy sources, we have chemical. Uh, and so chemical fuel sources are sources that tap into the energy of chemical bonds. And so that is electromagnetic energy that's stored within these molecules and the orbiting electrons. And so that, that would be uh, coal, for example, natural gas. They're all chemicals that will, um, that will ignite and form combustion. And combustion is that breaking apart of the chemical bonds and releasing that chemical energy. Um, and in a sense, uh, photovoltaic and, and thermal solar sources, so thermal being um, mirrors focusing sunlight and boiling a tank of water, photovoltaic being uh, the photons actually hitting a surface and due to the photovoltaic effect, creating a current flow, so direct conversion of radiation, of solar radiation into, um, into electron flow, is also electromagnetic in nature. And the mechanical sources are taking actual mechanical energy, so advection, the bulk flow of a fluid, causing a, uh, a wind or a propeller uh, to spin and generate energy. And hydroelectric is, is using uh, water, which is another fluid. Uh, wind and water are both fluids causing things to spin and ultimately generating electricity. Nuclear is utilizing the nuclear force, which is the force that actually bind the protons and neutrons together uh, within a nucleus. This was always fascinating to me specifically because it's a very eerie kind of unknown uh, force when, when you first are studying it. And it's a fascinating force that's bonding together positive charges and neutral charges, things that should naturally repel each other. Uh, but the scale is also very small. Uh, the scale of the nuclear force is, is on par with helium. Uh, it's a small nucleus uh, of, of an atom. And so if you have a heavy atom like uranium, that strong nuclear force that's coming from the outer nucleon, which could be protons or neutrons, are not actually reaching across the diameter of the nucleus of the atom. Uh, they only reach a short distance into the nucleus. And so you have instabilities that can form uh, when you have really heavy nuclei. And you can liken it to, our professors likened it kind of to a liquid drop model where you have 
a drop of water and if it's vibrating and pulsating, uh, surface tension can actually snap it in half. If you look at a sink and you have, you adjust the water flow uh, such that it, it breaks from a continuous stream to a droplet stream. And that surface tension is essentially snapping that neck and breaking it into individual droplets. Well, just like that, if you hit a nucleus with a neutron, that's what we call a thermal neutron, uh, it's traveling at about 2,300 meters per second, which is really slow when it comes to subatomic particles. Um, you can hit it in such a way that resonates the nucleus. And when it pulsates and becomes oblong, uh, the nuclear force along the center line of that obloid is actually attracting itself like surface tension, and it snaps apart called, in a reaction called fission. And the interesting thing about this is that fission releases a lot more energy, thousands of times more than uh, releasing an electron from electron orbital. So uh, nuclear fuel is inherently uh, high energy density. It's very efficient and um, it, it is ultimately derived due to what's called a mass deficit. And so there are there is a binding energy that's involved with holding these nucleons together that is more efficient at a certain uh, combination or, or ratio of neutrons and protons. And so the most stable isotope that we know is uh, iron and iron 56. And so uh, everything kind of tends towards that on the periodic table. Uh, things below it tend to fuse, or at least they are at a lower energy state as they fuse. And things above it tend to fission, and they're at a lower energy state as they fission. Wait, so that's jump backwards a little bit because of nuclear fission is so new and so to us in terms of being able to use for energy sources, why do you think we started with chemical and with like the coal and natural gas? Cause that's really how we started to using energy in a mass scale for our people. Why do you think we went there? Yeah. So that's, that's a good point. And in fact, it's funny you mentioned that because fusion is the natural energy source of the universe and uh, fission is not really very common in the universe. Uh, humans tap into fission energy, but it's not something that is naturally occurring very often. Uh, you really have to refine and, and gather those heavier, heavier isotopes together and expose them to certain radiation fields. So I would say uh, initially, uh, humans were utilizing electromagnet, uh, electromagnetic and chemical reactions to generate energy because they were far more accessible. Um, they took less energy to initiate this chemical reaction uh, as opposed to, say, fusion or to sustain a fusion reaction or uh, fission, which requires a lot of mining and um, and condensing of the, the specific isotopes you need, uh, called fissile isotopes, to actually use as a fuel source. There are natural fission reactors, and one of the most popular ones is in Africa, where there's just a natural abundance of fissile materials, and it causes uh, kind of a hot spot in the earth. Yeah, with getting our coal and getting the natural gas, something that was readily available that people were quickly kind of found in the in the ground, which that one has a lot of long-term effects as well. A lot of people associate like nuclear energy with Chernobyl or Fukushima, but really we look at all these different energy sources, there is an impact for each individual one of them. So with, with coal... There, that's a massive scale operation that has to be done. The same with natural gas. Like you're pumping lines all over the place to be able to pull something from miles underneath the ground at times. And with coal, you're having to send people all the way underground to very harsh conditions at times to be able to dig this stuff out. So that is a very harsh impact as well. All of them, all of them are. But how how long really does does coal last whenever you're burning it? Is it a each like say little nugget burns for about five minutes, 10 minutes? Like why, why do we have to use so much coal to power an area? Yeah. So that's a great question. So coal inherently has a, a, a lower energy density. And so when you look at a coal plant, a typical coal plant, that's 3000 megawatts, they're using about two uh, two train deliveries, each of 32 train cars full of 
of coal. Uh, so 64 train cars full of coal per day. Wow. It requires um, mining and then transportation. So in Georgia, Plant Bowen, for example, uh, they're shipping their coal from Pennsylvania to Georgia in two train loads a day. Then they're dumping it into a big, um, essentially, sifter, and they're pulverizing it into a very fine powder. And that fine powder is then injected into a cyclone, into a combustion chamber. And it's essentially a, a, a fire tornado inside of the <laughs> combustion chamber. And that fire tornado is, um, is really just used to boil water, turn it into steam, and turn a turbine. And a lot of the primary power sources we have, natural gas, uh, coal, nuclear, they're all used in the same way in the sense that the fuel is generating heat, the heat used in the steam cycle to convert water into steam um, because steam inherently can hold a lot of energy. Water molecules are really great at holding energy um, reversibly. So you can give it energy and take it away. And that energy is delivered to the turbines to uh, turn them and convert them into electricity. The fascinating part about this cycle is the conversion of energy through the whole thing. And you can look at each chemical, uh, nuclear, photovoltaic, mechanical, each of these uh, methods of generating energy and see kind of the, how the flow of energy goes from the original source to uh, electricity ultimately and onto the grid. I would uh, be happy to go through each one. <laughs> I don't think we have a three and a half, four hours to be able to hit each individual one. It could, it could be a little, little challenging. Sure. Yeah. So, okay. How about this? In summary, uh, for nuclear, for example, those nuclear reactions are depositing energy electromagnetically into the water and into the cooling. That energy is being is thermal energy and mechanical energy with the flow of water. And as it becomes steam, and the steam, mind you, is at 540 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, they call it dry steam. The steam can actually light paper on fire. I love to use that analogy. Wow. It's counterintuitive. <laughs> so at a very high pressure. And so it's flowing, it's flowing very quickly. And this goes for coal plants, too. The steam mass flow rate is about 300 pounds per second. So about uh, a, the weight of a, of a light car flowing through these pipes every second. Wow. There's a lot of energy in that steam. And that steam is, um, like I was saying, thermal and mechanical energy. And then that is turned into electromagnetic energy, which is then delivered through the generator onto the grid. And the voltage, well, I guess we shouldn't probably get that far yet, but uh, the grid is a, is a fascinating substructure as it is. And it's also very lossy, which we can talk about later as well. So Matt, we just discussed talking about coal, those 32 uh, trains that have to come in at, which is basically 64 trains a day to be able to run these coal plants that take up a lot of space. What is that like with the other types of energy that's out there? How is, what's the comparison between say natural gas, um, solar and kind of wind energy? What's the difference? Sure. So uh, one ton of coal is equivalent to about 150 gallons of oil, uh, which is equivalent to about 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. Um, and all of those are equivalent to about one uranium fuel pellet. So a uranium, what's a uranium pellet? A uranium fuel pellet is essentially the size of a pencil eraser, and it is stored or stacked inside of a fuel pan which are arrayed together in a fuel assembly, which are then uh, further arrayed into the core of a, of a nuclear reactor. And so uh, when compared to coal, if you look on a global scale, uh, the, in 2020, we were consuming 160,000 terawatt hours uh, or 576 extra joules of energy uh, for that year. That correlates to 24 billion metric tons of coal. That's insane. Yeah. So if you look, if you stack this coal up, um, given its packing density, this is equivalent to a mountain of coal four times larger than Mount Kilimanjaro per year. Per year. And per we're, year. We're getting this stuff from all different places around the world. And it's really, 
wreaking havoc on the ground sources. And it could get into messing with tectonic plates and getting in messing with um, sinkholes and stuff that are popping up everywhere as well, because of you're really having to dig into the ground and, and get this uh, sources. How do we right. obtain natural gas? Like how, what is the process? Cause I know with my, we mine deep into the ground with for coal, how do we obtain uh, natural gas? Natural gas is a similar process. It all starts uh, pumping oil, crude oil out of the ground. And there are many different qualities of crude oil uh, around the world. And it takes certain better refineries to use um, thicker or, or uh, less refined natural reserves of oil. So oil that has other contamination that needs to be filtered out. But ultimately, natural gas comes from an oil refinery where uh, the, this oil is processed and it is separated into various types of, of, of fuel and specifically um, into different alcohols and different um, uh, natural uh, fossil fuels, I should say. And so natural gas is actually part of that process. It comes from refining crude oil. Wow. So yeah, oil goes into using a lot of things like that. That's the thing we, we think of, I think of natural gas as that lightweight kind of floating in air and you can kind of smell it whenever you turn on a stove at times to be able to see that. Uh, and it smells almost like eggs to me. Then you have it for doing your, uh, some people use it for furnaces to be able to get that, which my house is on, uh, natural gas to be able to use for energy as well. So that's still, it's, it's a lot of impact on the environment to get this oil, which we get from many places around the world, uh, to be able to have that. So that's another process of drilling. You're digging into the earth's surface to be able to, to get that energy. So it has another effect there. Why is, this is a kind of like a transition as well, because this is what I'm seeing right now is there's a big trend for solar power and wind energy. There's grants where people are putting these solar power uh, pieces on top of their house. They're setting up these solar panel, panel farms uh, in these massive field areas. And then you have the, off the ocean coast, you're seeing people are putting out these massive fan turbines to be able to, or wind turbines to be able to collect all this energy. Why did we transition to trying to do this now? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great question. I guess I'll start with the wind since that's probably a shorter answer. Um, wind can uh, wind turbines can have an impact uh, not only on the environment, but just aesthetically for um, property owners and for people around the wind farm. So a lot of them have been moved to offshore locations um, somewhere out in the ocean. The downside of that is that they have the cost efficiency goes down because it's a lot more expensive to build those, those wind turbines out in the ocean. Solar, it, there's a big push for solar right now because more and more research is coming out with more efficient solar panels, um, pushing even efficiencies in 40%, which is, um, which is pretty unreal. And also new methods of producing uh, solar panels that don't use as many rare earth elements. Uh, one of the big gating factors for solar right now is that they do require uh, very rare elements and they are naturally expensive. The, the other challenge with solar right now is really to do with battery storage. So it's, it's hard to integrate the solar energy um, into the grid. And so to do that, uh, in which this, this integration process is called base load generation. And the base load is essentially the grid as we know it, where coal, nuclear, hydroelectric, a lot of big sources are putting that energy at high voltage into the grid. Well, solar panels don't generate high voltage. So their voltage has to be stepped up uh, and stored and, uh, in, in, in large batteries or other chemical storage devices. Um, but it has to be not only stored up, but the voltage really needs to be increased to uh, over 40,000 volts to transmit it efficiently uh, across the grid. And that's primarily because of what they call I squared R losses, which is losses due to the motion of the electron uh, on the conductor, uh, which generate heat. And that motion I squared is, is proportional to the square of the current. 
And, uh, and so if you increase the voltage, you have less current uh, that's actually being, uh, that's, that's losing um, its energy uh, and dissipating it as heat and ohmic losses in the power lines. So on top of that, you also need to create an alternating current from this direct current that's stored in the batteries. So it's more efficient right now to utilize solar um, on site. So you use the solar panels on your roof to generate power for your house directly. Uh, use it in a factory to generate power in that factory right now. But our technology is still getting there when it comes to incorporating massive solar farms onto uh, the national grid. I'm, I'm going to stop you there for a second. Can you give us me a small, small explanation of what is the grid? Sure. So the grid is a compilation of transmission lines. And uh, the way this works is uh, each power generation plant, it starts out sending very high voltage power um, onto high tension wires. And it's at a high voltage, of course, because you can transmit it over miles of line uh, with very small losses. And as it gets towards its destination, the voltage is stepped down and step down again through these substations near neighborhoods or cities, and ultimately down to the voltage that comes out of your outlet. And about 6% of that energy is lost due to um, heat and ohmic losses. So uh, six or 60? 6%, however, okay. funny you ask, in total about 66% of the energy that's generated at these power plants is lost before it's used. What? Or at least wasted. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. Uh, fortunately, uh, forty-seven percent is uh, can really be mitigated and and saved. So a lot of these losses are reactive losses, and so there's two types of of loss mechanisms for power and transmission lines. One of them is is the real component they call it, which is resistive losses. The, the energy is literally being dissipated as heat. And the other is reactive losses, which um, really is a, is a component of impedance, which is a phase shift of, it has to do with the waveforms interacting with themselves and canceling each other or um, making this AC wave that we have in three phases on our power lines uh, less efficient at generating energy or delivering energy, I should say. Um, due to uh, a lot of different loss mechanisms, but uh, I won't really get into that too much right now. But the amount of energy that's available for useful work is called your power factor. And factories, high inductive loads like big motors can um, have pretty low power factors. They, they can cause a lot of these um, reactive losses. And those losses can affect the balance of phases on all three phases and actually affect the entire local grid in that area. And so power companies will charge large factories that don't have compensation networks or things to compensate for these reactive losses more per kilowatt hour, uh, depending on the quality factor of the power that they're using and how they're affecting the grid. Out of curiosity, is one of the ways we're losing power at point of, I hear a buzz sometimes when I go by some of the centers. Is that buzz where power is being lost or is that where it's just converting down from a higher energy to a smaller energy? I don't know if you know that answer, but I was just curious. Yeah. I mean, you could look at it as a loss. Certainly. It's, uh, it, that, that electrical energy is, is being dissipated as mechanical energy, which is turning into sound waves. Yeah, and, and sometimes so you hear like little pops as well and yeah and so uh, the the magnetic component of the electromagnetic field oscillating around the, uh, around the wire is uh, interacting with something that's ferrous or or responds to magnetic fields and, and fiber so those would be another form of loss yep and am i a crazy person whenever i look at power lines sometimes i see like heat waves or that are coming off of it that look almost like a like a fuzzy kind of look is is that possible because that heat that's coming off or am I just a crazy person and see like I'm seeing oh, no, that's, something um, off of it? Yeah. So if you're seeing a fuzz, it's likely Corona discharge. Uh, corona is another form of loss. 
and it, it has to do with uh, the dielectric constant of the insulator and also the air around it, around the conductor. And so this AC current is generating an alternating electromagnetic field, which is interfering with or interacting with uh, the air molecules around the wire, including the, the insulation itself. And that insulation has a certain dielectric strength. Um, and so corona is the, the, I guess, visual manifestation of some of that energy dissipating into the air molecules. Well, that makes me feel better. Uh, and my mind over the years, I've thought for You're 33 years, like I'm a crazy person. I, I see these waves and I look up and I talk to people and they're like, I don't see it. What's going on? So I'm like, okay, thank you for that, that clarification. Whenever you're talking about storage here, and I've heard people saying that you only are able to store that energy for 48 hours or a couple of certain period of time when you have these battery packs in your house. Is that just a, a dirty rumor that people have, or is that a reality on being able to keep that energy in the battery packs that are in your house? Well, I think that depends. Uh, depends greatly on the manufacturer, um, the quality of the battery. I, I would think that they would have uh, batteries now that last longer than 48 hours, but specifically, I'm not actually sure where they're at with that technology. Um, but I'm sure. Yeah, it, storage is a challenge for sure. And you do, um, batteries can only hold a charge efficiently for, for so long. And for that matter, they can only be charged and recharged uh, so many times. And ultimately, they eventually lose their efficiency each charging cycle. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that with my Prius. I've, I've, it has 174,000 miles on it. And I see like my little battery pack that's in it slowly get a little, a little less and less efficient. For because that's this age and how many times it's charged and gone up and down. Yep. And that just ultimately has to do with the, it's, it's called dendritic growth. Um, it's just the migration of these, these molecules in the battery cells themselves uh, start to attach and cake onto uh, the electrodes. And so it prevents the flow of electrons through the solution. Now you mentioned earlier when talking about batteries and, and getting the solar panels and getting all this energy and stuff in, in place, we have to get a lot of these are rare minerals and rare pieces of material from the earth to be able to make these batteries that go into our car or that go into our uh, houses for being able to store energy. What is your opinion on, we're making a big move over to hybrid and electric cars. Do you think this is a good move to be able to have this now, or do you not think the technology is fully there yet? So I think that's a great and multifaceted question. Uh, for, for batteries themselves, I think the big challenge right now is getting efficient, long-lasting batteries. Uh, a lot of companies have come out with battery recipes, so to speak, that use less um, rare metals and and a lot of these are lithium based, but there's a, a number of other different uh, chemical compositions of these batteries. Um, some of the newer ones specifically are a lot safer in terms of um, failure modes. So let's say that you take a battery pack and cut it with scissors. Um, some batteries might explode if you do that. Oh, um, that's great. <laughs> right. Others are completely safe and you can cut them in half and they still actually operate. Oh, wow. And those are the batteries that are uh, the technology that they're really utilizing with the electric cars. Now, I hear this question a lot because there's always a trade-off, right? Um, I hear a lot of people say the grid is just not set up to charge that many electric cars. And I would say, yeah, there's, there's definitely truth to that. Uh, but I am a huge proponent of hybrid cars and electric cars for that matter. Um, there's now plug-in hybrids that can use 120 volts straight from your house. You don't need a 240 volt setup or anything like that. Um, and those get, um, you know, 150 miles a gallon. Hybrids, I've been wanting to get a hybrid for a while now. I think the, the answer to the current energy crisis is we really need to start mixing uh, renewables with, uh, in my opinion, nuclear. Now, coal, coal has its own efficiency issues when it comes to scrubbing the CO2 um, out of the emissions. And these are called scrubbing towers, which you can see in any coal plant. They're big, tall, cylindrical uh, barrels near the plant. And as the regulations and requirements on emission standards uh, start to, to stiffen up with coal power, 
more and more power is being used off the top to run these scrubbing towers. And uh, as they get towards the 90%, or I should say 10% emission standard of the actual CO2 produced versus uh, what comes out into the environment is uh, it can draw up to 40% of the output of the power plant to run the scrubbing towers. And a lot, a lot of this is electrochemical. MIT came up with some new scrubbers that are more efficient, but right now, yeah, coal plants, are they're really not making anymore, first of all, uh, because of, uh, well, specifically of the CO2 emissions, but also because we're ramping up uh, renewables, some of those renewables. So there's also a balance of uh, how consistently these sources can generate power. So for solar, it depends on weather, depends on uh, day or night. Wind depends on weather as well. Uh, there's talk about solar panels in space, which would be great if, if that's possible. Let's do it. Um, the cost seems like it would be pretty high. Um, and so then there are things like hydroelectric, which is a renewable energy source that's very consistent. Uh, you can generate electricity at night. Nuclear is a huge uh, game changer in terms of actually being able to dial up and down the power output. And that's the true load following capability. Load following is just saying that you're meeting the power demand dynamically throughout the day. You're not just generating much of excess power. You're giving the grid exactly what it's consuming. And with coal, there's a certain flow rate that you need to maintain an efficient combustion reaction. You can't really dial it back. With hydroelectric, I mean, you're not really dialing it back, but you can. You can easily just uh, adjust uh, what the resistance essentially is or how much power or juice you're getting out of the fluid as it flows through the dam. So that's good at load following as well. Solar and wind um, don't really apply necessarily because they're not going onto the, the primary grid, but they are uh, more dependent on uh, the environment. And so their terminology for this is called a capacity factor. Capacity factor is essentially how how reliable is the source of energy and how consistent is it? And nuclear has uh, the highest capacity factor right now. Geothermal has the second highest. Geothermal is very consistent, a very good way of getting energy. Um, but I, to, in order to prevent myself from going on a rabbit trail here, I'm going to say that, yes, I'm a huge proponent of uh, hybrid and electric vehicles. Geothermal, well, you just mentioned that. Is I, I just went over to Iceland. It was very neat seeing uh, how some of that works. We didn't get to go in a plant or anything, but seeing how they have their plants built, how the ground is kind of, they harness it. That is very regionalized, correct? To be able to get um, geothermal energy, correct? Absolutely. Yep. You've got to have the right environment, the natural environment there um, to be able to tap into geothermal efficiently. Now, between, I've mentioned earlier about the environmental impact on drilling and getting all these resources out of the ground, all these dirty rumors that I call it dirty rumors, but all these rumors that we hear that because it creates a confusion because it creates a political split between people of really on getting coal, getting natural gas, getting this crude oil and stuff out of the ground is they're really a limited resource or saying there's a hundred years left, there's 200 years left. What, what is your scientific research kind of telling us? Yeah. So I've heard the same, uh, the, and my research has kind of suggested the same. It's in the hundreds of years, right. For coal. Uh, it depends. It depends how far we're willing to go to mine these resources. Um, and of course there's a carbon footprint involved with mining. So Mining is a, is a very important thing to consider, even for, for solar. A lot of the carbon footprint of solar comes from mining the precious metals that are used to make the solar panels. With coal, coal, of course, has the, uh, the largest mining print. Uh, a lot of mining equipment is used to, to mine coal and just the sheer quantity of coal needed uh, to operate coal power plants is not, it does not, not conducive to a, an efficient carbon footprint. Nuclear also has mines. Uh, the amount of mining that's needed to gather the fissile material to make nuclear fuel is uh, vastly smaller than coal. And then you also need to consider the actual spatial footprint of 
the the power generating um, plant. So uh, for wind, you need a lot more surface area. Uh, so let's actually just go through kind of the equivalent. Let's do it. Uh, a, nu a nuclear reactor is, is let's use that as the baseline. Same with coal, uh, say 3,000 uh, megawatt output. It's a square mile of land. The plant itself doesn't take that much, but uh, for pro proliferation and safety concerns, it takes up a square mile. The equivalent power output for solar would be would range actually from 45 to 75 square miles, and for wind, the same power would require around 260 to 360 square miles. So there are trade-offs to how much land is needed to generate the equivalent power uh, of a large-scale uh, reactor. So we went from one acre to like 400 to like 4,000 miles. So one acre for nuclear, or was it one mile? One square mile. So yeah, one square mile. Wow, that's a that's a huge jump for each individual one. It is. And it's important to consider this um, when considering the population growth of the world. And this population growth is certainly nonlinear. Uh, there's been talk, interesting talk actually about for example, filling the Sahara Desert with solar panels and using a superconducting um, transmission line to, to transmit that power across the ocean and, and to Europe. Um, these things are kind of pipe dreams at the, mo at the moment, but uh, certainly fascinating to think about. But there's also environmental implications of that that should be considered. Uh, for example, natural convection in the Sahara Desert, if you cover it in shade at all, it's going to change the natural convection properties and the airflow and a lot of the jet stream and the airflow coming from the desert is depositing um, a lot of silica and sand into the Amazon rainforest, which is... Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's all connected. So it's important to consider the connections, the natural connections between all of these things and the impacts. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that would increase desertification in, from the Sahel as well. That's right below it in terms of expanding out the desert, possibly as well. I, I don't know. A great question. Yeah. But all things that are important to be considered. And in the net, it's also important for us to, to diversify our approach, uh, whatever is, is possible right now and whatever is most efficient right now, we, we should be doing. But we should also not limit ourselves by uh, not considering the growth of nuclear and other things that are uh, a higher upfront cost, but lower maintenance costs uh, down the road. A nuclear plant, for example, has almost no moving parts. The only moving parts are essentially the control rod assemblies, which are barely moving and the, the actual coolant pumps themselves. Yeah, I'm going to pause you for a moment and say that stop this episode for a moment. And that's make this a two-parter where we do, I'll release this episode one week. And then instead of doing our usual two week split, I'll do back to back weeks for it. So Matt, because you're talking a lot about the nuclear energy here that I know you have a lot of great information on. So that's have our next episode specifically talk about nuclear energy. Do you have the time for us to be able to do this? Sure. That sounds wonderful. I look forward to it. Um, as we wind down here, is there any last second things you want to say before we jump into our next interview? Only that I am very excited to talk <laughs> about nuclear. <laughs> I, I agree. So as we're starting to go out here, I want to remind you that to look out for all these updates and all this stuff, the content that I release out, like, subscribe, tell your friends. If you want to email me, I am at Cade, which is spelled C-A-D-E, at learningfromfriends.com. Uh, I am on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Reach out any way you would like to. Uh, be kind. Be courteous. Uh, this is, makes the world a little bit of a better place here. But most of all, as we leave out here, is remember to let your curiosity fly high. This is Cade Curtis with Learning From Friends. I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Have a wonderful day.